Dr. Brian Bantam is Associate Professor of Theology at Seattle Pacific University and received his bachelor's degree from Houghton College, a master's in theological studies from Duke University Divinity School, and a PhD also from Duke University Divinity School. He has authored and published two books, Redeeming Mulatto and the Death of Race. His teaching and research focuses on the intersection of theology and identity, exploring how the claims of Christian identity are illumined and challenged by the realities of race, ethnicity, and gender. And then I'll just share this tidbit. Dr. Bantam would choose a root beer over an IPA, if you remember me saying this last night, which I think is really interesting. Um, any day of the week, he's a sugar fiend. Um, he would also choose a lint truffle or a Ghirardelli bar over and against a Hershey bar. And he and I agree on this, that Hershey's is just, should not ever be called chocolate. It's just really, it's a crisis, I think, of faith to call a Hershey's bar chocolate. So, so we are delighted to have uh, Dr. Bantam lecture again for us this morning. Please join me in warmly welcoming him. Good morning, faithful few. <laughs> it's good to see you all. I woke up this morning and I saw like the rain and like the cool air coming. Through. I was like, oh, Seattle. <laughs> ah. A couple of days ago, it was like it was. It looked like this, but I walked outside. It was like sticky, and I was like, I, my brain didn't know what to do to do with it all. Um, but I'm very glad to be here with you all this morning. I hope you've had uh, a good week. This has been my first like long period of time at Princeton, and so um, it's just been nice to kind of walk the streets and kind of pretend like I'm a smarty pants student again. Um, and but at the same time, it also it feels like a like a real a, like its own little world. I'm like, Phew. like I'm like I feel like I'm in Hogwarts or something. It's, it's bizarre, um, but it's been great to get to know some of you all and to um, and walk with you all this week. Um, so the title of my lecture this morning is Unruly Gaps Toward a Theology of the Visual Life. Last night I wanted us to consider what happens when we do not attend to the economies of visuality that we move within. That in the reformers' resistance to icons, images, and even the Eucharist as a visual sign of God's presence, they unwittingly redirected the currents of visuality towards the preacher, the pastor as an icon of Christian faithfulness, and pointing towards a vision of life and wholeness that also fundamentally delimited the possibilities of non-male bodies in Christian life. Of course, we could say that the phenomenon of being reduced to one's body or having one's body become the most determinative aspect of one's personhood is not exclusive to questions of pastoral ministry. But I also hope that we can begin to see that the problems of modern racism, sexism, misogyny, anti-LGBTQ rhetoric, and policy are not too distant from the world of Pro the Protestant Reformation creates. Consequently, the modern world, in the modern world of Protestant Reformation, the, in the, the modern world the Protestant Reformation helps to conceive is a world where some of us feel our bodies acutely. Poet Claudia Rankin describes this phenomenon as being between you and you. Um, her prize-winning book of poetry, Citizen, an American Lyric, is a meditation on navigating this two-ness of how one sees oneself and how they are seen in the world. She writes, some years there exists a wanting to escape, you floating above your certain ache. Still the ache coexists. Call that the imminent you. You are you even before you grow into, an under, into understanding you, are not anyone, worthless, not worth you. Even as your own weight insists you are here, fighting off the weight of non-existence. She continues, the patience is in the living. Time opens out to you. The opening between you and you, occupied, zoned for an encounter, given the histories of you and you, and always, who is this you? Unlike W.E. Du Bois's double consciousness, this is not a two-ness that is kept from being torn asunder by sheer force of will or brilliance or intellect, or both. Rankin's in-betweenness is not a consequence of two realities within herself that somehow do not coalesce. Rather, an in the in-betweenness is rendered in contrasting sights, and through unfolding encounters, how she sees herself and how she sees herself seen, 
Sight is recognition of herself as she is, but also an accounting for the many conflicting ways she sees herself in a mirror. In watching Serena Williams play tennis, in watching Caroline Wozniacki mock Williams' body in a charity match. With accompanying artwork, stills of television and sports events, Rankin's poems do not allow the visuality of her world to go unnoticed, unaccounted for. She presses us into the interrelationship between world and image and body, and how blackness exists in the midst of these creating and creative forces. For Rankin, the black body is a visual phenomenon, an aesthetic being. With Rankin, my theological questions have begun to coalesce around the aesthetics of our being, how they have, are both created in problematic ways, but also how these realities are negotiated, opened up, and reoriented towards freedom and wholeness. I can't help but see these as Christological and anthropological questions that somehow our theology must share Rankin's task, to trace patterns and movement of refraction that illumine and obscure us. The artist is one who works in these economies of incarnation, of obscuring and revelation, feeling, seeing, thinking the world around them, drawing from the phenomenon of their existence, of their faith. They knit or paint or stitch or carve something into being that reflects the moment that they sit within. Through the witness of artists, we are encountered with the holiness of the world that artists see confusing the distinction between church and world, sacred and profane. Carrie James Marshall writes about his work as an artist. There is a complicated exchange within a painting between the subject and the picture and the subject who views the picture. The artist wants to set up a negotiation between the two in order to draw attention to something. And what I want you to be aware of in these pictures is the act of looking. It's both the act of looking and then locating yourself in the relationship to the subject you're looking at. And here, here Marshall's image is a really interesting one. He does a whole series of images where we see black faces and black bodies almost overdone, right? I mean, they're, they're black, black. There's only handfuls of people, right, who are, are maybe this dark. And you say, maybe, what is, what, is, what is Marshall doing here? Is it almost mocking something? But part of what he's doing is actually playing with color theory. This idea that there, there really can't be a real, true black. And so these blacks are created through the layering of colors. And if you get really close, you actually see little flecks and hues of varying colors. So the black is never one thing, but you have to kind of stare at it to see the difference and the subtleties in it. And yet at the same time, what Rankin does in this particular moment of the studio is play on this idea of sight and visuality, of the artist who is seeing and being seen, and as one of my colleagues suggests, we actually see a kind of playfulness with even dimensions, with one part of the image being kind of having a kind of perspective, and then the other part of the image towards your right kind of flattening out, or to your left, yeah, your right, left, yeah. Towards the left, kind of flattening out, right? So even kind of dimension, depth, starts to get played with and messed, and messed with in multiple ways. So Marshall's reflection upon the nature of his work should sound a bit familiar, though. In essence, Marshall sees his art as working within an economy that is not unlike Florensky's description of the Eastern theologies of the icon and icon writers. Both understand a continual relationship between looking and becoming, seeing and knowing. The artist's vocation, their identity, is grounded in this interrelationship between sight and materiality. There is no word without incarnation. There is no image of God without water and dirt and brush. What is the artist but a mediator of sorts? One who stands between you and another and conjures something into existence that requires you to see yourself differently, to acknowledge that you are looking at something, that you are in the world and that you are seen, like a sermon or reading a scripture, perhaps that we are undone and knit together again in ways that are made possible through the mediation of this one who stands in our midst, who walks with us when our parents are sick or who prays over our child when they are first born. Without the acknowledgement that we are looking, that what we see is only a glimpse of something, perhaps our inclination is to stabilize the one we see preaching week after week. And the artist never lets us do this. <clears throat> 
What if we considered pastoral ministry or teaching or any aspect of Christian life as an, art, as an artistic exercise that is always navigating these economies of the visual, where our work is something closer to Ellen Gallagher's notion of work, where we are, what she says, is interested not in signs, not as static, but as moving, as things that start with something that has already been discarded. She says, I try to make image, my, my images through the unruly cracks in the edifice, underneath which there is something to be protected. Gallagher's work in her deluxe series takes the common visuality of advertising culture, but then stretches or cuts or builds upon, and in doing so, unearths the underlying racialized and gendered forces pressing upon the viewer and the consumer. In both the disruption of the images and then the sheer number and scale of the, in the, of the minute and small images that build up over time, we begin to see how we are inundated, added to ourselves, cut out in various ways, ourselves advertisements, inhabitants of someone else's vision of what we ought to be. But by speaking to, to the deconstructions, the additions, the embellishments, and the cutting out, she also makes the body known points to a real human being who has been the object of someone else's work, but nonetheless navigates and even refuses the powers that would render us two-dimensional. I wonder if this act of deconstruction and reconstruction is one of the central economies of Christian life, a life of incarnation, a life that resuscitates the moments of our coming into being, that first breath drawn in by those earth creatures so long ago the enfolding of Yahweh's identity into a people who would speak this God's name into the world, in the welcome of a young Jewish woman who said, how can this be, and then offered herself to let it be so, and of course in a word made flesh, a body, a life of taste and sense and hope and sight, seeing and being seen in the world. And with each assertion, there is also a deconstruction of something false that has been papered onto us. In a way, Perhaps the Christian body is an iconic body. It lives as the artists live and see and create, creating a life with the constant recognition of being seen, and yet what we see is never complete or whole or exhausted. Like Adam and Eve, just after they ate the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, our eyes are opened, but we do not understand what we see. We hide what is beautiful and we destroy the material world in our midst in order to cover it. But what if the economies of visuality cannot be obscured or hidden or smashed into bits? What if visuality is an inevitable reality of a world that where we, imbued with consciousness and love and hope, also respond to the world in its color, its texture, its hue, its shade? If we are to begin to see the kingdom of God more truthfully, if we are to become a people who can see the wholeness of our bodies and lives, who can see difference and not fear it, or silence it, or disregard it, if we are to become true images of God, perhaps we all need the artists to be our priests, so that we might embrace the artistic as a Jesus way, as an, incarnational, an incarnating life with God and with one another. But how do black artists help us towards this way? If Luther, if Martin Luther re represents a wrestling with an image, Harlem Renaissance mentor and documentarian and supporter, Alan Locke, we see an embrace of visuality and its reflection of our body lives. During the Harlem Renaissance, Alan Locke believed that the key to black uplift lay in the nurture of black artists and the cultivation of a black aesthetic encouraging, promoting, mentoring black poets, novelists, and visual artists, Locke hoped to cultivate a unique cultural aesthetic. He wrote, there is a double duty and function to Negro art. And by that we mean the proper development of the Negro subject as an artistic theme. The, the, the role of interpreting the Negro and the Negro in the American scene to America at large is important. But more important still is the interpretation of the Negro to himself. Frankness compels the admission constructive self-criticism dictates the wisdom of pointing out 
that the Negro's own conception of himself has been warped by prejudice and common American stereotypes. To these, there is no better or effective antidote than a more representative Negro art of wider range and deeper penetration. Now Locke's reading of black art and its critical telos from black subjects and towards uplift actually shares a critical overlap with Luther's response to the problematic, to problematic and idolatrous um, visuality. Both men saw art as primarily shaping their communities as didactic in aim. Artists such as Romari Bearden or Elizabeth Catlett reflected this sense of aesthetic and self-realization, representing the history, dignity, power, and story of black life and its varied hues and styles. The Harlem Renaissance and then later the black arts movement of the 60s and 70s cultivated art for uplift. Perhaps with less explicit theological frameworks, these artists were products of a communal hope and organization. In the 30s and 40s, community art centers such as the South Side Community Art Center, directed by Margaret Burroughs, or the Harlem Art Center, founded by Augusta Savage, became incubators, a priestly formation, if you will, for those who would visualize the humanity that they, know, that they knew they had, but so often did not see or were refused on daily basis. Images seemingly reified and distorted the truth of, a, of who a people were. And to this end, visuality, image, art was not to be discarded or completely avoided, but should be oriented towards uplift, towards gospel, towards enlivening and an enlivened life. But although they share a certain orientation towards formation, didact, a kind of didactic purpose, Locke's, in, Locke's formative posture includes a vital distinction that should inform um, how we begin to understand the relationship between art and the body more broadly. Black existence has never been without its body. If anything, black existence is the product of the visual economy wielded against dark bodies to forge an identity reduced to skin or nose or hair or hips. We can see these in the life of, um, of, one, of one another. And so while the reformers' understanding of visual life sought to maintain and stabilize the gospel, a gospel that lay beneath words which laid beneath the tones and within the body of the one who declared those words of truth, in Locke's didactic formula, the artist is the medium of a gospel, integral to the imagination, to the, imagination, to the creative capacities, and the truth that underlies any image, that the beauty and humanity of the one who created the image and the beauty that the image invites all of us into is in fact black. Though didactic in its aims, Locke points us to the ways black art was explicitly participating in these economies of visuality, seeking to reimagine and re-image the truths of black existence in broader American life. In a way, Locke's gospel, if we can call it that, even while resisting the idolatries of white supremacy though, nonetheless maintained a certain maybe perhaps stabilized gospel of what black life could look like. Far from imitating um, European classic quote unquote masters, Locke called artists to develop a unique style of Negro art, that he sought to build a visual culture that reflected the fullness of black life and personhood. But maybe perhaps we could also problematize Locke in the black arts movement or the Harlem Renaissance approach in some ways. Like any movement that attempts to identify the parameters of faithfulness, this is what faithfulness looks like. This is what it does not look like. Locke's hope to create a visual culture of African American life, he risked, perhaps, creating lines of representation and inauthenticity that can only be understood as random. How do we make sense of the black artist who did not follow the stylistic sentiments of a Romari Bearden or an Elizabeth Catlett? of those who were not in the streets of the civil rights movement or volunteering their time creating posters and protest art? Does the use of classic forms or motifs disqualify the artist's black genius or as a representative of black artistic and intellectual life? In this regard, we could say perhaps this art continually hung on the precipice of propaganda, much like Martin Luther's art serving to delineate black life and in doing so possibly reduce it to a handful of cultural markers, styles, or aims. At the same time, something new though is happening in the Harlem Renaissance and the black arts movement, and we can't discount this. 
the currents of visuality that coalesced to create the black body are not submerged and dammed up. They are not resisted. They are always opening up upon themselves again and again, to such an extent that black artists, much like icon writers, were writing a truth that white supremacy had taught us to obscure. Rather than the image being that, that of a word made flesh, the truth is the fulsomeness of black life and its possibilities, the truth of God's life and presence in their lives in mundane and wonderful, and wonderful ways. Black artists become priests and mediators of, this, of the truth of their bodies fashioned into, the, into an image. To draw again from theological understandings of the icon, the black artist creates mediums that participate in an economy of freedom. The artists, through their skill and insight, create moments, windows that illumine, imbue, or awaken the wholeness in the black viewer, or speak to their pain, or simply tell a story. Now, while Locke's hope for cultivating a black cultural aesthetic was critical in his moment, and perhaps one of the few responses one might image, one of the few possibilities one might imagine in the segregation and violence of the early 20th century, it created questions for some. What are the resources? What are the aims of art? Namely, those born after the civil rights movement who often shared fundamental commitments to black life and thriving, but at the same time, they did not always see their art as necessarily oriented towards protest movements or civil rights causes, nor did they see themselves as distinct from, the, from those hopes or rhythms. While it has been captured by many names, the new black aesthetic or post-soul, Writers, artists, scholars share a family resemblance, or as Bertram Ashe suggests, a quote-unquote school of thought that identifies three markers of what he, they call a post-soul aesthetic. These are, first, a cultural mulatto-esque sense. What this means is that there is a kind of mixture of mediums, a mixture of images, that we are not, in a sense, only drawing upon black rural life, for example, but we are drawing upon examples of modern, of, of ancient, or not ancient, or classic images. So here, Kahindi Wiley is a good example of this, taking old classic forms and messing with them, reorienting them in some way. A second aspect is black exploration, what he calls, arguing that blackness is constantly in flux, and that the way the post-soul aesthetic responds to the 1960s called for an affixed and ironclad black aesthetic. And so here, black exploration is to look at always the multiplicity of the ways in which blackness can be inhabited, represented, and seen. And then lastly, using an illusion disruption strategy that takes familiar tropes and flips them or turns them inside out to be di to, it, to turn them inside out and to disorient and create new meanings. And we see this kind of work in Kahindi Wiley and Harmonia Rosales, for example. The post-soul artist uses history with disregard and recognition, identifying the veils and shredding them, braiding them, hoisting them anew. Like icon writers, they are attentive to the dogmas etched into the wood, cuts that were meant to be repeated and honored. They attend but fill in with new color or ignore shape even while displa displaying mastery of technique and depth of insight. So here I don't want to suggest that the post-soul aesthetic is the only way forward, but I do think that they press us with some critical reminders. One is that knowledge cannot be possessed. And secondly, that our bodies are ways of knowing and being known. And thirdly, that we cannot escape the, partic the particularities of our placidness. And this includes the forces that have shaped our moment and nor the realities that constitute the moment. So we always occupy a space. We occupy a moment. We have to draw upon the histories, the images that make up where we are in this particular moment. But at the same time, they can be bent reoriented. So here the notion of tradition is not about repetition, right? But a tradition points us to various ways in which some people have tried to describe something and therefore can create, offer us a kind of raw material from which to begin to say something from our moment and our time. So for me, a post-soul theology of image and body shows us three interweaving images, or three interweaving threads. 
First, that we are material creatures of time and limitation. I mean this not in an abstract sense. I mean this in an artistic sense. I pull out a board, some brushes or tools, and what I can create is directly related to my understanding and skill of the materials before me. I have to understand that I am working with the limitations and the possibilities inherent in them. And in doing so, I come to understand the possibilities and limitations inherent in me. And what I create is the briefest glimpse of how these truths coalesced in a given moment. Second, to follow the thought of Walter Mignolo, we think where we are. And consequently, we create out of the histories, current realities, and intersecting communities and bodies that constitute our lives. Theology is the description of that moment. Out of the contingency of our placidness, our work is necessarily hybrid, overlapping, and oftentimes contradictory. But it is nonetheless concrete and present in the world. But what this intersection and contingency means is our work will always have a quote unquote mulatic character. I'm sorry, I'm drawing off this idea of a mulatto, but it's a mulatic character, a hybrid character. And what I mean by mulatic is a paradoxical and confounding embodiment of being human in, in th that in the end cannot be reproduce itself. It stands perpetually open. It cannot determine the culmination of its work, its children, its legacy. And these futures are always multiple, always Pentecostal, if you will. And yet it works unreservedly for the openness of these possibilities in others. It demands the conditions of becoming and works to create those opportunities within itself and in the world. But it can only do so from this moment right now. Lastly, a postal theology of body and image rests on the unequivocal assertion that the word made flesh that our God was hidden, and while revealed in the people of Israel, becomes a confounding image and body, confronting us with the promise and perplexities of any human being that we see, and are seen, and in this interchange, who we are and who we are not is never exhausted. We are on a journey with God towards self-knowledge. As we discover what his bodied life means, so too do we begin to discover what we do and do not know about who we are and who one another might become. And along this journey, we might be surprised at what is used to make the kingdom seen. An old law, a fisherman, a tax collector, a teenage woman. In our moment, post-soul, new black, whatever we want to call it, in fact is a Pentecostal moment. A moment that seeks to create and speak in new tongues. To be in such a way that our lives speak beyond the grammar and vocabulary that we've been given. Our bodies and lives become new tongues, new songs, bushes set aflame that never get exhausted. And so I want to leave you with a few thoughts on why these contemporary icon writers are important for us in our, in our current moment. First, in theological education, we stand at an edge. We see fewer students pursuing a calling to ministry in explicitly Christian institutions. Instead, hearing a call that, make, that takes them into law or public policy or leadership development or nonprofit entrepreneurship, church attendance and those, pushing, and those pursuing degrees of divinity are shrinking. But what if they are shrinking not because there are fewer Christians, but because what, they, what those people saw in their churches were whitewashed walls and the word of God distilled to male bodies? Spaces stripped of the very reminders of what makes them human, their color and their line, their shade, their shape, their feature or their texture. What if they are leaving because they know propaganda when they see it, and they are instead choosing spaces where they hope, they believe their bodies are going to matter, to be seen for the wholeness they feel they are? Perhaps the artist of the post-soul school movement can begin to point us in a different understanding of traditions and bodily formation. That perhaps traditions, patterns, when they are bodied and living, are not repeatable. As much as I love and am enlivened by Eastern iconography, its dogmas etched into wood can guide, but they can also bind. Or perhaps they open us, these images can open us to new questions of, of value and beauty in ambivalence as we see whether it's in Wiley and Rosali's images that ask us who is bringing dignity to who, 
And this is a beautiful thing that we see kind of in the interplay with Wiley's work, um, especially, that he, he kind of draws explicitly on these old tropes, right? And part of the idea is to say, oh, I, and, and if you know anything about Wiley's work, he'll find just random people on the street and say, would you, want to, would you be willing to sit for a portrait with me? And the person says, oh, sure. And so he takes them back to the studio and he flips them through these books of all of these kind of old classic images and then paints them into them. And so notice what Wiley's doing here. Is Wiley is kind of drawing upon these kind of traditioned images and forms, but now inserting them with a different kind of content that radically changes the connotation, the meaning, the possibility, right? And for Wiley, he, he says, I want them to see themselves with dignity. And one of the critiques we might ask, we might have of Wiley is to say, well, wait a second. Why weren't they dignified when they were on the street, right? Why do they have to have a classic form? But here, part of what Wiley's doing is just simply confusing the idea of where is the locus of dignity? Where is the locus of beauty? that perhaps we wouldn't see in other places. Another example of this is the artist Carol Walker, who in a very different way re draws upon tradition by creating these, silhou these silhouettes. And what she does is she takes the kind of old racist silhouettes of exaggerated lips or the piccaninny and, and kind of completely like empties out all of the color. And so what you get are these very like frightful, grotesque images that for Walker, by highlighting the grotesque, reveal the deeper grotesque underneath it, right? The larger system that creates and creates us in various ways. And so in these very ways, the artists press us to uncomfortable histories, to see the ways that we are maybe in fact complicit in difficult ways. And so, and in this ambivalence and the uncertainty, we might begin to see surprise, the unexpected. And in this ways, these, the unexpected circumvents our conventions and our grammar or visual cues to bring us a true, true into view. And as we all wrestle with the ambiguity and embodiment of our sources and aims, perhaps we form and teach those who come to our churches by letting them feel the ambivalence and uncertainty. Perhaps we see ourselves as something more akin to Margaret Burroughs' community centers than walls erected for the cultivation of a discipline or a clearly defined notion of Christian life ought to look like. Perhaps they ought to actually come to us so that we can teach them how to create. In these ways, black artists show us that enunciating, living out our faith is a constructive material process that both references our bodily life and points beyond it to the histories of our people, both troubling and inspiring. It points toward a humanity that we sometimes cannot imagine and so gathers up old reference points and reconfigures them. Sometimes it simply means recognizing and welcoming the bodies that seemed to reflect that we are not and begin that we are not and beginning to see that they reflect something of who we are. And hopefully you're already starting to think about, wait a second, this kind of sounds like scripture, right? Taking these old references and now creating new associations, right? Taking a kind of figure that was once defiled and turning them upside down to now be the figure of purity. So perhaps we study the images, techniques, and insights of the artists who have shaped us so that our students might discover how they might create in the future. We do not see our spaces of worship and community as vessels for ideas to be held or to be reproduced, but canvas and clay and wood and word. We prepare people to create spaces that work with and within the currents of visuality that is Christian life, that is all life, lives that are seen and felt and touched. And in doing so, we begin to see everything from the person who preaches to, to, a, to the um, to the soup line, to who serves communion, to PowerPoint slides, to rhythm, to song, to drapes, to even carpet maybe, as extensions of the gospel, as incarnations of good news, that the word became like us so that we might become something more free, more loving, more human, and that this work must be seen and felt in order to be true. Thank you. <clears throat>